Coming up in today's newscast, Prime Minister Netanyahu threatens to call for early elections. Another reason to rid the world of fax machines surfaces, and Israeli athlete Lona Chemtai Salpeter makes a devastating mistake. Prime Minister Netanyahu on Sunday threatened to schedule early elections if a solution to the ultra-Orthodox conscription bill cannot be found within the next two weeks. After deeming the existing draft law as unconstitutional this time last year, the High Court of Justice gave the Israeli government a deadline to formulate a new policy. That deadline has now also been pushed to December 2nd after secular and religious factions within the coalition failed to come to terms. The current draft of the conscription legislation requires yeshivas, or ultra-Orthodox learning institutions, to meet quotas for the military draft. If the quotas are not met, then financial sanctions in the form of reduced state assistance can be levied, in increasing amounts per year. But religious parties will not support the motion in the Knesset. Netanyahu largely blames the situation on Health Minister Yaakov Litzman, who also heads the ultra-Orthodox United Torah Judaism Party. Litzman has been vocally opposed to the draft legislation and has threatened in the past to leave the coalition. Speaking to top ministers yesterday, Netanyahu said that the coalition would have until the next cabinet meeting to solve their problems. Otherwise, the cabinet meeting will change focus to setting a date for elections. Netanyahu said, quote, The ball is in Litzman's court. If ultra-Orthodox parties want to reach a compromise, we can get through this, end quote. Notably, however, Litzman was absent from the meeting as was Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman, who stands on the opposite side of the debate and is a big proponent of the bill. Also worth noting, however, is that perhaps the ball isn't in Yaakov Litzman's hands as much as the Prime Minister may think. According to Haaretz writer Yossi Vertner, quote, a Hasidic rabbi will decide if Israel goes to early elections, end quote. Vertner explains that Litzman doesn't do anything unless his rabbi, the head of the Ger Hasidic sect, approves, a rabbi that Vertner says is in dubious touch with reality. Israel has just prevented tens of thousands of balloons from being shipped to Gaza over the past several weeks, concerned that they would be used to launch flammable devices into Israel. Three shipping containers full of balloons were stopped at the Ashdod port and confiscated after incendiary kites and balloons flown over the border have continued to set Israel south ablaze. In recent months, over 7,000 acres of land has been burned, causing millions of shekels in damages, and these kites and balloons are sent over often by the dozens daily. Israel has been facing mounting pressure to respond to the improvised flammable devices launched from Gaza starting March 30th, the start of the weekly massive March of Return protests. At least 165 Palestinians have been killed in clashes along the border with Israeli troops, and one Israeli has been shot dead by a Palestinian sniper. A truce was reportedly struck with Hamas Thursday, with the Israeli fire service saying that yesterday marked the first day in several months that no fires were sparked by balloons. But Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu reiterated on Sunday's cabinet meeting that he has not and will not accept a ceasefire for anything less than a complete cessation of hostilities from Hamas. He also vowed to bring total quiet to Israel's southern residents. Unfortunately, a complete cessation of hostilities has not been achieved. Incendiary balloons and kites continue to fly over the border into Israel unabated. Five fires broke out on Saturday alone, and then on Sunday when an incendiary balloon landed in the Shara Negev Regional Council, a video of that balloon exploding was uploaded to illustrate just how dangerous they are and how the mechanism worked. Thankfully, the fire it caused was put out in minutes, and no damages occurred. But balloons were also found falling in Sterot near the city's Holocaust Monument. Residents from Israel's southern communities that border the Strip gathered in Tel Aviv Saturday night as well to protest the government's perceived failure to stop the flaming terror, calling the government hapless in handling the situation. Demonstrators blocked the highway near the Tel Aviv HaShalom railway station, entering the road at every red light. One protester from Kibbutz Kfar Aza said, quote, If the government wants to restore deterrence, then restore it. The situation is unbearable. We are like ducks at a shooting range, end quote. The continued spat between the United States and Turkey over the detention of American pastor Andrew Brunson has now exploded all over the world stage. Turkey has charged Brunson with espionage and being part of the PKK and Gulen movements with intent to divide the Turkish state uh, charges that Freedom House calls a farce. 
And if, in fact, Brunson spent a year in prison before being indicted on trumped up charges along with several other Americans and American embassy workers. And then in May of this year, a Turkish judge dismissed all of Brunson's witnesses without listening to any of their testimony. And so now, the United States has hit Turkey with major sanctions, but rather than caving even a little, Turkish President Erdogan is doubling down. Joining me now with more is Davidi Hermelin, president of the International Center for Public Diplomacy in Israel. Davidi, thank you so much for coming back in. Thank you. All right, so my first question, is the United States even going the right way about trying to get Brunson back with these sanctions? Well, Turkey is a very important country to the West, mm -hmm. since uh, it's the main superpower just in the border, border between those two tecton boards, tectonic boards sure. of Russia yeah. and the West. Yeah. And uh, Turkey is part of NATO, as mm -hmm. we all remember. From the other hand, uh, I don't agree with those who says that uh, this conflict uh, will serve uh, mainly Russia, because we see that the financial crisis in Turkey uh, is taking down uh, also the Russian ruble with it. So I think that it's about time that all the members of uh, uh, NATO will understand that it is okay to say that the free world has a leader, which is the United States of America, mm -hmm. and the United States earned it, and it's about time that people will understand that the coalition, the political coalition of the free world and the United States is led by the United States. And it, it, it is good to the free world than uh, the chaos we suffered uh, during the term of President Obama. Well, so, okay, you mentioned a moment ago about how, you know, the ruble is also taking a dive along with the lira, which is now somewhere around 7.2 lira per dollar, uh, the worst it's ever been, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's been talk in Turkey about switching standards, dropping the dollar and moving to trading in other national currencies with China, with uh, Ukraine and with Russia. Would that help solve the ruble's problem, the lira's problem? I don't know, to be honest. Time uh, will tell us. Mm. But uh, I would recommend the Turkish uh, government instead to insist and to change financial uh, alliances, uh, to take step back and uh, to say, yes, we are part of a world coalition of uh, free nations, and it is okay that we will compromise and that we will satisfy the wish, the political wish, of uh, uh, our allies in America. It is okay to follow your big brother sometimes when he comes to protect, uh, to protect you. Okay. And we all should remember that beside that, that the West uh, needs Turkey with it. Also, Turkey needs the West uh, in alliance because the aspirations of Russia in the former Muslim republics of mm -hmm. the former, uh, in, the, in the Muslim republics of the former USSR mm -hmm. and in the Middle East, like in uh, Syria, for example, I think that the back uh, of the West behind uh, uh, Turkey is important to the Turks as well. All right, so my final question, uh, you know, you're very familiar with internal Turkish politics. What, what do you think is their motivation, truly, to be holding Brunson in the way that they're holding him in contravention to you know, European countries' orders, to the EU, to America. What, what's their motivation here? And also, why isn't anybody talking about the other Americans who are currently in detention in Turkey? Well, I think that the Turkish administration has a doctrine, and this doctrine is the Neo-Ottoman doctrine. And uh, this Neo-Ottoman doctrine uh, uh, aim is to influence the entire historical uh, uh, sphere, let's call it like that, or the zone of uh, uh, the old uh, Ottoman Empire, mm. which means the Balkans, parts of Eastern Europe, the Muslim republics of the former USSR, and the Middle East. And if you will uh, follow the process in the Middle East, for example, you will see that even during the uh, time uh, of President Morsi from the Muslim Brotherhood mm -hmm. in Egypt, yeah. they didn't accept the seniority of Erdogan as the new sultan of, uh, uh, the, of the region. Yeah. Because they are also Arabs beside uh, Muslims. And uh, Turkey now is very isolated because their uh, aspirations to lead the Muslim world, at least in the Middle East, uh, fall down. 
And uh, they should, I think, better for them to accept the idea that Turkey is not the number one state in the region, but important sure. state in the region. All right, Davidi Hermelin, thank you so much for coming in again. Thank you. Yet another woman has now come out against Zionist Union MK Eitan Boshi with charges of sexual harassment and indecent acts. Though the allegations are past the statute of limitations, fellow Zionist Union Knesset member Shelly Yachimovich shared the story on her Facebook page, taking it upon herself to post exactly how she felt about her colleague and the culture that allows his alleged behaviors. Yachimovich describes the story of a woman, M, who was in the IDF under the command of then battalion commander Broshi. She said she was sexually harassed on a regular basis, that everyone knew about it, and that at one point it even escalated to M waking up to Boshi in her bed with his tongue in her mouth. Yachimovich then goes on to describe what happened when M ran across Boshi in the street. M, quote, was already a self-confident woman, married, a mother, a professional, and a donor, but she was paralyzed, almost fainted, and came home shaking, agitated, shocked, and nauseated. Now to the unbearable question, why did she only remember now? Well, M didn't remember. She never forgot. The rifle doesn't remember. The target never forgets. End quote. The post is accompanied by a picture of Boshi captioned with that same idiom. And further in the post, Yachimovich describes that she did her homework and has verified the details not revealed about M in her post to protect M's identity. Now, Boshi was already in trouble after first apologizing publicly for grabbing the buttocks of his fellow Knesset member, Ayelet Nachmias Verbin. Then further allegations of Boshi trapping and attempting to assault a co-worker in an elevator were made on Israel's Channel 10. Zionist Union party head Avi Gabay suspended Boshi following these incidents, and Boshi has already filed a libel lawsuit against Gabay for 300,000 shekels in compensation, three times the legal maximum awarded in libel cases. Well, this isn't likely to go away so easily. Yachimovich also wrote that at least three other women have come to her with allegations against Boshi just today. Britain's Labour Party opposition leader is now again facing new questions after photos have emerged of him at the graves of the 1972 Munich Olympic terrorists. According to sources close to Corbyn, the Labour Party leader was holding a wreath during an event for Palestinian martyrs in Tunisia at an event to commemorate the 47 Palestinians killed in 1985 from an Israeli airstrike on a PLO base in Tunisia. Jeremy Corbyn himself even denied visiting the graves of terrorists and condemned the Munich massacre and its perpetrators, insisting that the event in question had nothing to do with the Munich terrorists. But the monument for the 47 Palestinians, according to the Daily Mail, is 15 meters or nearly 45 feet away from where Corbyn and his group uh, were standing. In reality, the photos taken just a year before Corbyn was elected show him standing over the grave of Atef Bseso the head of the PLO intelligence who helped orchestrate the 1972 Munich attacks, which claimed the lives of, Israeli, of 11 Israeli athletes. Now, it's also just a few meters away from the graves of the members of the Black September group, which physically carried out the attack. Now, this all comes amidst a massive firestorm surrounding the British Labour Party regarding its complete tone deafness to anti-Semitism. These photos also come just after a video from 2013 was released, in which Corbyn apparently compares the Israeli control over the West Bank to the Nazi occupation of Europe in World War II. Several members of the Labour Party who have raised concerns have either been forced out or have resigned over these issues, and clearly they aren't anywhere near being resolved. When the word hacker comes to mind, you think of cutting-edge technology and top-secret security networks. But Israeli cybersecurity firm Checkpoint has now found that hackers could get to millions of otherwise protected networks through a rather out-of-date medium, the fax machine. Checkpoint says its research has discovered security flaws in some 45 million fax machines worldwide that could allow hackers to access and take over the machines and spread malicious code across the private network. It works by the hacker sending a malicious code that the fax machine interprets as an image file. But when the fax machine receives and decodes the image, the back door in the network saves itself onto the network via the fax's memory. Now, coincidentally, this threat comes as Israel continues the long debate over its own fax laws. The fax machine has become a symbol for paperwork and poor customer service in the country. In fact, just this past July, the Knesset passed a law introduced by Likud MK's Sharon Askel and David Bitan, forcing public entities, hospitals, etc. to accept and respond to emails. After the bill passed preliminary readings in the Knesset last year, MK Sharen Askel explained that, quote, it can't be that in 2017 citizens are forced to use a technology that is inaccessible and whose time is past. 
The time has come for government services and hospitals to accept emails. We sent the fax machine to retirement, end quote. Well, it seems now that the fax machine isn't only inefficient, but dangerous. The good news, though, is that for those of us who may want to hold on to fax machines for one reason or another, there is something that can be done. Experts advise checking for updates and software patches that fix this issue, or put the fax machines on a network separate from sensitive information. That or, again, recycle the machine for parts. More and more businesses today are shifting the way they work, out of the offices and away from stationary infrastructure and networks. And that's why we need an updated approach to network connectivity and security as well. Well, Israeli startup Meta Networks is offering exactly that. And here with more is CEO and co-founder of Meta Networks, Itai Bogner. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank it's you very much for having me. All right. So uh, what does Meta Networks do? Tell me about uh, the NAS platform. Sure. So uh, Meta Networks, we are in the enterprise network security space. Uh, previously, uh, employees and uh, they were working from inside offices. Their, work, their uh, business applications were located in the same building or same you know, office uh, protected by a trusted network or a security perimeter in the professional uh, uh, lingo. Uh, and obviously today, people are working from everywhere. You have contractors, sure. workloads have moved to the cloud, consumed as SaaS applications. So traditional security solutions are inadequate to that right. new realm. And then, so and so, what exactly does Meta Networks do? Like, thank you. So we built this uh, network security platform in the cloud. Everything, all the security mm -hmm. stack is delivered as a cloud service. It's a completely software-defined solution. You don't need to install anything in your offices or data center, etc. We know how to connect all of those locations into a, an overlay network, a virtual network, and we deliver all the network security stack as a service. Wow. All right. So you know, how does this work and how is it different from other cloud-based networks? Uh, first of all, there are not that many cloud-based networks. Sure. Okay? Not a lot of companies build networks. Uh, it's actually the concept is rather new. Uh, previously, we couldn't do, do it because of cost even. But today, with the advanced, uh, you know, advanced capabilities of the cloud and pricing going down, we can actually build a, a network that we route all the traffic through that network. It's still cost effective. The benefit is that we do see all the traffic that all the laptops of the uh, enterprise employees are uh, you know, consuming, and we see all the traffic going to the business applications, so we can analyze it and obviously protect. All right, now you mentioned, uh, you mentioned how there aren't that many cloud-based networks at all anyway. So how did you kind of fall into this? How did, how did you go about developing this? Ah, that's an interesting question. So, in, uh, so MetaNet was my fourth company. My first company was software. Uh, it was acquired by Checkpoint, and actually I implemented this idea 15 years ago, obviously without the cloud, before the cloud was available, so it was a bit different. Uh, so the vision was out there. Uh, but as I said, now we have the cloud, so in 27 it started to be economic, economically, you know, an economical uh, business or solution that I can deliver to customers. Uh, so it's, uh, it's implementing my vision 15 years ago, and delivering all the security from the cloud as a service. And it's already available? It is available. We have paying customers, uh, and we are growing. So we have a, a lot of POCs in the States, in the UK, and in Israel. Itai Bagner, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. All right. Now, moving away from science and tech for a moment, Israeli hospitals are now reporting record numbers of births this year, with maternity wards across most of the country now being filled to capacity. Some mothers have even been moved to other departments or have delivered their children in hallways. In Soroka Medical Center in Beersheba, there was a nearly 10% increase in births over this time last year. In July alone, Soroka Medical delivered 1,518 children, 7% higher than the monthly average. Ichilov also saw a roughly 10% rise in births in July to over 1,000. Now, summer birthdays in Israel are typically much higher than in the winter months, but that's not the whole story. Fertility rates are also reportedly significantly higher in recent years. In 2016, Israel rose to have the highest fertility rating of any country in the OECD, sitting at about 3.1 children per mother. The average for other countries is around 1.7, and according to OECD statistics, an average of 2.1 children per mother is required to ensure a stable population. So good news for us, and mazal tov to all the new parents. The night sky was alight last night with falling stars as the Prasides meteor shower drew massive crowds across the southern Negev desert, uh, where less light pollution actually makes it the best seat in the house to see. And of course, 
ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh has all of the details. Emmanuel? Thanks, Aaron. Well, according to a NASA meteor mm -hmm. expert, the Persides, which occur every year, typically in August, happen to be the most popular me meteor shower of the year, and this one specifically was the best. It's said to be one of the world's most, you know, impressive astronomical events, and every year thousands of people gather in Israel's oh. Negev Desert at the Mitzpah Ramon Crater for the clearest view possible. Yeah, no, I mean, I had a, a bunch of friends that actually drove down to the Negev and said it's quite the sight to see. They yeah. were all very happy that they made the trip to see it this year. Uh, but other than Israel, you know, what other countries were lucky enough to see the, the uh, this year's light show? Well, thanks to the clear skies last night, the U.S., Europe, and Canada were also lucky enough to see the Persides fall towards Earth. What's really cool, actually, is how the debris can get as hot as over 5,000 degrees Celsius and travel at something like 36 miles per second before oh they burn at the edge of the atmosphere. And the fact that the meteors are no bigger than a grain of salt is actually really crazy that we can see them with the naked eye at all. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm completely blown away with, uh, with what we can uh, see. You know? Yeah. But, you know, I, I read up a little bit about this meteor shower, too, here. Uh, and did you know that the name of the comet that actually causes the Perseid meteors is romantically named 109P Swift Tuttle? <laughs> That's sure a very romantic, you know, <laughs> yeah. name that you have there. So the Swift Tuttle comet, along with the ice and dust around it, travels at something like 130,000 miles per hour, oh, burns gosh. up as it enters the Earth's atmosphere, which in turn leaves the unbelievable trail and, you know, sights that we see in the dark sky. Uh, that's absolutely incredible. And, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but so the Perseid cloud stretches all the way along the orbit of the Swift-Tuttle comet, right. uh, which has been in orbit, I think, I think you may have said this, around the sun for 133 years, something yeah. like that. Uh, and then the stream of debris that the comet is leaving behind it in its orbit, uh, that falls down and hits the Earth's atmosphere and, and burns up, and that's what we're seeing? And that's exactly what we're seeing. You okay. clearly explain it a lot better than I do, but yeah, basically to put it in simpler words, this is one shower you definitely don't want to miss. So Aaron, next August we're carpooling down there, no? Oh, we're definitely, we're definitely <laughs> carpooling. All right, thanks for the update, Emmanuel. Thank you. All right, now, in a devastating turn of events, Israeli athlete Lona Chemtai Salpeter gave up what was sure to be at least a silver medal when she stopped running too early during the 5,000-meter contest at the European Athletics Championships. Just last week, Salpeter took home Israel's first-ever gold medal at the 10,000-meter event in Berlin, and then yesterday she was looking to keep the successes rolling. Salpeter was comfortably close behind the first-place runner Sifan Hassan from the Netherlands, and during the, la the second to last lap. But suddenly, she began to slow down and pull away from the track. Apparently, she miscounted the lap number and only realized when the bell indicating the final lap was rung. But by then, it was too late. She began sprinting to catch up as soon as she realized her mistake, but the rest of the pack of athletes had already closed the distance, and ultimately, Salpeter took fourth place, with the Netherlands keeping first, Britain coming in second, and Turkey taking third. At the actual end of the race, at the actual end of the race, a visibly distraught Salpito collapsed on the track in tears. But it's not all bad news from the recent race. Despite losing precious time due to her mistake, Salpito still clocked in at 15 minutes and one second, a new Israeli record. And the athlete even received words of encouragement from Prime Minister Netanyahu, who took to social media to praise Salpito. He wrote, Lona Chemtai, you are a true star. You have brought great honor to our country. The Hebrew Word of the Day is brought to you by IDC Samru Ulpan, open to everyone. And now for our Hebrew Word of the Day, we are still exceptionally proud of our star runner Lona Chemtai Salpeter, even though she stopped just a little too early in last night's European Championship race. But her performance did inspire today's Word of the Day, which is Mukdam, meaning early. Now, clearly, stopping to, stopping to run Mukdam Midai, or too early, can cost you a race. And not many people are particularly fond of waking up Mukdam, or early, when they don't have to. But sometimes being Mukdam is a good thing. For example, they say that you're only really on, on time for a job interview when you're Mukdam for it. Now, also, it's never too Mukdam or early to start saving up for our futures, or, you know, that trip that you always wanted to take. Just remember that the one thing that it's always Mukdam midai, or too early for, is to quit. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight will be partly cloudy but hot with a low of 78 or 26 degrees Celsius. Then tomorrow you can expect a slight rise in temperatures to a high of 86 or 30 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.71 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.tv and don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Aaron Porras. Thank you for watching.